Um, I hope you enjoy the poster sessions very much. Uh, maybe just for the ones that you are joining now, they are going to be there for all the week. So just hopefully you can go and revisit the posters as much as you want to. Um, that's the why the, the room is open all week. And now let's start uh, with our um, lecture by David Hughes. I mean, he had we have a very nice uh, first lecture on Monday and well, we have the continuation now. Thank you, David. Okay, welcome back. Um, so are there any questions about anything uh, left over from Monday that anybody would like to bring up? Okay, um, right, so I was talking about thermalization and I defined what a thermal state is. It's a state of your system where the observables have the thermal equilibrium probability distribution. And there are many such thermal states because the observables are in the limit of a large system at you know, a set of measure zero of all the operators. Right? And so all the non-observable operators, they're just free to do anything in the observables, in the thermal states, right? And that's essentially why, you know, in statistical mechanics, we have equivalence of ensembles. Um, is the difference between the different ensembles uh, doesn't affect the probability distributions of operators on small subsystems. It's only global things that are different between the ensembles and that's why they're equivalent. But that's a, you know, the point is there's a much broader set of ensembles that are thermal equilibrium um, than the ones you learn about in statistical um, mechanics class. Essentially, any initial state which can thermalize will go to a proper thermal ensemble in the limit of long time. Right? And so there is just as many proper statistical mechanical thermal ensembles as there are proper initial states right? for a system that thermalizes. Right? Um, okay, so I want to say a little bit, a little bit more about how that works. Um, you know, this is basic fundamental stuff, uh, uh, but I think it's, it's good, to, good to go over it carefully. Um, so, so this, you know, it's a very general discussion. So I'm talking about the dynamics in a very general terms of thermalization. So, so let's say we have a system which does thermalize, which means if I start it, if I take the limit of a large system, start that large system in a non-equilibrium initial state, and wait for a long enough time, it goes to a thermal equilibrium state, right? which is what we assume in, in statistical mechanics. Um, and David, you, but just to be precise, uh, or to reiterate, the, when you say thermal equilibrium state, you mean it in this very, you know, very I mean, special way. As not... I defined it, as I defined it, yeah. right? It's, well, I, I would say less special. Right, because it it's a much broader definition of what a thermal state is than the thermal equilibrium ensembles that everybody knows. I see. So I would say it includes all thermal equilibrium states that people are familiar with, but it's it's actually you know a much bigger set than is usually discussed. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, could you remind me again what you mean by uh, the probability distribution for observables? I mean, if you if you were to measure that observable in this state, you would get certain outcomes, which are the eigenvalues of that observable, and they will have those outcomes will have a probability distribution, which is exactly what it would be in thermal equilibrium. A quantum state gives the probability distributions for the outcomes of any experiments you do on that system, right? So really a quantum state is a probability distribution in, in that sense, right? It, it, defines, it defines an enormous number of probability distributions for all the different possible experiments you could have done. Right? This is of course assuming Right. Of course, when you have a quantum state only once, you can only do one experiment, you only get one outcome, and you can't really test that. Right. So in order to test 
the description I'm giving you. You need to be able to prepare a quantum state multiple times. Um, but you know, theoretically, you know, if we if we know the state, we can ask what these probability distributions are. Does that does that make sense? Um, so when you mean what, if thermalizes, it reaches a certain distribution for the observables. Yes. And that distribution is determined by your experiments, is that what you're saying? Well, it, it's, it's determined by the initial values of all the conserved quantities, and that defines the thermal equilibrium state. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm not sure, sorry. Um, But you know when I say the dis when I say the distributions, right? Okay, so let me let me just say what I'm saying here and try to address that. So our initial state, right? The case that's interesting is when the initial state is not in thermal equilibrium. So the initial state is not in thermal equilibrium, and and that means observably not in thermal equilibrium, right? Because thermal equilibrium is a question about observables, right? And so it has to be observably out of thermal equilibrium. And that means there's at least one observable, which I'm gonna call a hat at time zero, which is my initial state. So initial means time zero, and that zero means time zero. And that has some non-thermal probability distribution, right? And what it means, for example, theoretically, right? If I wrote my initial state in terms of the eigenstates of this operator, that would then explicitly show the probability distribution of all those eigenstates, all those eigenvalues. Um, and and they would be, uh, that would be a probability distribution that's different from, from uh, what it is in thermal equilibrium um, for, for the same conditions as this initial state. Okay. So I, does, it, does that address the question that was being yeah, asked? I, I think so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now, so this operator, you know, and there's, you know, typically there are many, if, you, if you're out of equilibrium in a large system, you're out of equilibrium, uh, many, many observables are out of equilibrium, but let's just talk about one right now, uh, which I'm gonna call A. Um, now, under the unitary time evolution, this operator becomes, it has a time dependence. It doesn't commute with the, with the time evolution. And it becomes this operator, a hat of t, which is u, a u dagger, where this u is the unitary operator, which gives the time evolution. Um, and so now at time t, it's this operator, a of t, that has this probability distribution, which is out of equilibrium. And so that you know, the non-thermal probability distribution is now on a different operator, right? Because everything is time evolved. It's moved to somewhere else in, in operator space. Um, and and right, if the system does thermalize and this is an observable, it's not going to commute with the time evolution, right? And so this, this evolution here will take our our initial operator, it's an observable, which means it just involves a few degrees of freedom, perhaps a single spin or something, or one site or a small number of sites, um, but it doesn't commute with the time evolution. And under this time evolution, the operator will get more and more complicated. It will, you know, this, this will, right, if this is on one site, these operators, if there's a non-trivial time evolution involve at least two sites, and that will make this operator spread to more and more sites, right? And so, so you have operator spreading. You know, this dynamics here will typically take the operator that's confined to a small number of sites and spread it over more and more sites as the time progresses. That's called operator spreading. Um, and so this dynamics takes the operator, spreads it over more sites, increasingly more sites as the time increases. And as it gets to more and more sites, it really becomes less observable in that you know, it's harder to observe because it's a much more complicated operator. And eventually it's gonna to spread to so many sites that it's beyond your technical capabilities and it becomes invisible. 
So it becomes less observable. And finally, in the limit of long time, it becomes non-observable. Okay. Now, some systems do not thermalize, integrable systems, MBL systems. And one of the mechanisms, one of the, you know, except you know, there's another case of uh, scars where it's a different mechanism. But in those systems, both MBL and integrable systems, they do not thermalize. And the reason is they have many observables that actually commute with the time evolution. And so if they're initially out of equilibrium, their probability distribution never changes because they're conserved and, they, and the system stays out of equilibrium forever. So, so if you have many observables that remain observable to time infinity, then you, you can put yourself out of equilibrium and remain out of equilibrium to time infinity due to those conservation laws. And that's basically one, one of the main mechanisms of failing to thermalize is, is just too many conservation laws. Uh, in terms of unitary evolution in wave function, like intuitively one thinks that you get these e to the i e t factors and at some point of time they should maybe repeat so in unit revolution like it's common to expect revivals of some sort and would that then... uh, well that's a question of orders of limits right as i as i said the th uh, thermal equilibrium it's only sharply defined if you take the limit of a large system and when you take the limit of a large system the revival times go up uh i think even faster than exponential. I think it might be exponential of exponential. So those revivals are properties of small systems. They really just go away um, in, the, in the limit of a large system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a very, very good point. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me just... Now, um, can, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so it seems like if you if you know that at time t goes to infinity, there's still going to be some things that are observable. Exactly. Right? Like that's, about, that's what I'm just about to say. What about the observables at late time? OK, then I'll let you say it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so at, at some late time t, we can have B of T is an observable. Okay. And as you said, at any time, of course, there's the same number of observables at all times because it's the same system, right? Um, so B of T is an observable. And this came from. Um, B of zero, which is U dagger of T, B of T, U of T. Right? So this is taking this operator and asking what operator at time zero evolved to become this guy. Right? Now, if this is an observable, a system that thermalizes, it's going to thermalize going forward in time, and it's also going to thermalize going backward in time, mm -hmm. um, because it's thermalizing basically because you know, none of the observables commute with it. Um, you know, and if they don't commute, they evolve, they, they evolve non-trivially, both going forward in time and backward in time, and the operators will also spread going backward in time. And so this operator, which since it's an observable at this time, it's a few site operator. If we evolve it back in time to the beginning, it becomes a very complex many site operator. And in the limit of large time, this guy is not observable. So, so for, for large T, uh, B hat of zero is it's both non observable and therefore or as a constant, well, in some sense, it's also non-controllable, right? If you, if you can't observe something, you can't control it, right? Um, so your state preparation, which you, know, you interacted with the system or something interacted with the system and put it in a non-equilibrium state, uh, 
it's not able to couple to this operator, right? Because if you could couple to this operator, you could observe it, right? Um, and so this operator, B of zero at time zero, nothing's been able to do anything to it. So it's just gonna be in a random state, a high entropy state. And so it's gonna be in a, have a distribution which looks like thermal equilibrium, at least for almost all such operators. Um, so basically what's happening is the dynamics, it's a flow in operators which looks like this. So here, let me just say one side operators of which there's of order N, two side operators of which there are order N squared, many more than here, right? And then we're gonna have, uh, let's say K site operators with, with K, uh, much bigger than one, but still much less than n, right? And then finally, we're gonna have, let's say, L site operators with uh, L of order n. And almost all the operators in the system are over here, right? Um, and there's, the, the dynamics is a flow, very strong flow in operator space in this direction. So things that are out of equilibrium here, these operators, which are observable. So these are observables. Observables. These are less observable, right? If K is not too big, maybe, you know, Reiner Blot could, could observe it, right? But nobody else, right? For example. Um, and then, and then these ones are non-observable. Reiner Blot a question. Is, a, is an experimentalist in Austria who has an ion trap system and they, they love measuring very high order operators on their spins. So yeah, question, go uh, ahead. The, does this, is, the, is there a, an implication of this paradigm on which there are states that we cannot measure. For example, if we just have a pure state, we've fully defined all the operators, right? But this seems to suggest that there's some correlation length or some K locality on all the states that we believe to be preparable. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the assumption here. Okay. That in the limit of a large system, you cannot control the operators beyond a certain order, and almost all of the operators in that Hilbert space are not observable and not okay. controllable. Um, okay, thank you. Right, and so so there's this, the, the dynamics is because the number of operators is increasing so strongly, right? This is four to the L operate, four to the N operators here, Whereas this is just of order n, of order n squared, of order n to the k. You know, these are polynomial in n, whereas this is now exponential in n over here, right? And so the number of operators is, is growing very rapidly along this way. And so when an operator evolves, it's evolving in operator space. And it, this is like a funnel, and it just goes this way automatically because that's where all the operators are. And then there's a very weak, flow coming backwards, there are very special operators over here that under time evolution, a very small number of these guys will actually get simpler and become more observable. But it's a very small number of these and an exponentially small number of these. And so there's this very weak flow going the other way. And that's, that's uh, these guys, right? So if I have an observable and I run it backwards in time, and make this B of zero, this is a very special operator because it under time evolution gets simpler, right? And so that's like a little tiny set over here of these operators. Almost all these operators will just wander around in this space and never get simple, but then there's a very small set of them that'll actually get simpler, right? Um, so we have this flow and this is, 
essentially the source of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and so what happens is the fact that you were initially out of equilibrium is a property of the probability distributions of the results of, it, of these operators, the observable operators in the initial time. And your state preparation, all these ones you can't control, they're at equilibrium because you couldn't do anything. You, know, you did nothing coupled to them. So they're at equilibrium. Right? And then what happens is with time, the part of the system that's out of equilibrium flows over to here and gets hidden. And it's no longer observable. So it's a unitary time evolution. So nothing goes away. It's just the fact that you were out of equilibrium is put over here where it's not observable. And so you're in thermal equilibrium now. Um, you're in a special state. You're in a special state that if I ran time backwards to my initial state, I'd be out of equilibrium. That's a very special state, right? But it's, it's not observable. You can't, you know, there's no observable that can tell you that that's, that's going to happen if you ran time backwards, right? Of course, now in the experiment, you might be able to approximate running time backwards and show that, but, if, but you know, you'd have to run time backwards to a very high precision to actually make that happen, right? But people are trying to do that in experiments, you know, run a dynamics forward and run exactly the same dynamics backwards. It's a very useful thing for, for exploring the physics. Right. And so people are trying to approximate that, but they're never going to be able to approximate it exactly, right? Um, so eventually you'll go far enough forward in time that you've gone to thermal equilibrium and you can't tell that it's a special state that came from a, an initially out of equilibrium state. Sorry, D David, can I ask a question? Please. I, I don't quite, ask, I mean, if you're talking in terms of operators, so what this picture suggests is all observable operators sort of slowly disappear because they become unobservable. But you define thermal equilibrium as, you know, thermal distribution for observable operators. So where are, where are the observable operators that still remain when I get into equilibrium? That's what I'm talking about up here, right? At any time, my observables are some set of operators. And, it, and say we're at some late time, after some time evolution and some initial state you prepared. Mm -hmm. right? What is observable at late time is an operator which corresponds to some very complex spread high order operator in, on the initial state, right? So what mm -hmm. is the observable at late time is some very special, fine-tuned, inaccessible operator on the initial state. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it wasn't controlled at all in the initial state preparation. It was already in thermal equilibrium. It was already in thermal equilibrium. Right? You know, when we couple to things and prepare, you know, when we couple to things with many degrees of freedom and prepare out of equilibrium initial states, what we control is just the observables, right? Because those are the only things we can couple to, right? If we can couple to it, we can observe it. I see. So the right? in the equilibrium state, the operators that are observable came from operators that were not observable. And in as the, a result, in the you know, statistics, yeah. that's equilibrium statistics. Yeah. That's well, they're just maximum entropy. They were just uncontrolled. So they're at maximum entropy, but that's exactly what equilibrium is, is given the constraints, you're at maximum entropy. But just to clarify, but, but during the whole dynamics, they are observable, yes? I mean, I, in the experiments, you can measure the magnetization at all. I mean, single particles observable that you couple can be observed all the time, yes? That's right. That's right. But it's, it, you know, I'm sort of describing the operators, right? So that... You know, I'm sort of, I always, I'm not sure whether it's some kind of hybrid, the discussion between Schrodinger picture and Heisenberg picture. Exactly. That's right. Like, yeah. you know, what, what I think what you're saying, Anna Maria, is in the Schrodinger picture, right? Yes. 
you have the observables, they're few site operators, and they're always observed, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Whereas this is more, let's look at a given operator and look at its time evolution, which is really more like the Heisenberg picture, right? Mm -hmm. And that operator, as a function of time, changes how, you know, what it looks like in the Schrodinger picture, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just got to get the lights to come back on. So any operator, if we, if we look at the evolution of the operator, a particular operator like this guy, which is an observable at time t, it will be an observable, it, it will be evolving with time according to this, this is just a one example, but it evolves with time. And at times near time t, it's an observable, right? It'd be, you know, but as I move away from T either forward or backward in time, that operator spreads because it doesn't commute with the time evolution. It spreads to become a more and more complicated operator. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, depending upon your technical capabilities, it stops being something you can observe, right? Mm -hmm. But then some other operator comes down and becomes something you can observe, right? So there's always the same number of, observ of observables, but really they're, they're taking turns being observable, right? Is there a wave yeah. function way of- Does, does that make sense? Yeah, yes, I know, I understand. I mean, I'm just saying on the experimental point of view, many times what we measure is collective operators, average over all different atoms, because that's what you get access and and I mean, they're ex I mean, they're simple because single particle operators yeah, yeah. that are sum over all of them. That but, if but if you have a system where those single particle operators are not conserved, mm -hmm. then that operator will relax. You know, you might prepare it polarized and it relaxes to thermal equilibrium. Yes, yes. And it's basically because what was that operator in your initial state has become something much more complicated. Exactly. And yes. what is that operator in your final state is something which was very complicated in your initial state. Okay. So they sort of swapped. Mm -hmm. OK. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so, so somebody else had a question? Uh, yeah, I was saying, is there a wave function way of understanding the same thing, like in the Schrodinger picture? Well, right. yeah, I guess you could, you take, right. So, so we have this initial operator, A of zero, which is observable. We take our wave function. We expand it in a basis, which are eigenstates of this guy. And we get a probability distribution of this operator thereby, right? Um, and we see it's out of equilibrium, right? Then we evolve it, it becomes a hat of t, and the eigenstates of a hat of zero become the eigenstates of a hat of t. And that probability distribution is now the probability distribution of a very different, much more complicated and eventually non-observable operator, and that's always preserved, right? And similarly, we have this guy, you know, b hat of zero and b hat of t. This is observable at this time. Um, but this is what, and it has a probability distribution, but that probability distribution is the same as what this guy had at zero time. So at zero time, I could have taken the eigenstates of this unobservable, very complicated operator and expanded my wave function in terms of those eigenstates and gotten a probability distribution. But because this is an operator that you can't couple to, you can't control, that's just gonna be a maximum entropy distribution. It's gonna be thermal equilibrium, right? And so therefore this one will too, because the probability distribution at zero time of this operator is exactly the same as the probability distribution at time t of this operator, because under unitary time evolution, they are the same thing. That's sound okay. I mean, there's a sense in which 
it'd be nice to make the shirt. Although this is a very nice picture in this Heisenberg. This Heisenberg picture is very nice in terms of operator spreading. The usefulness of a uh, Schrodinger picture that I don't quite as clearly see here is that then one could, I would like to be able to then say, I want to trace over the parts of the wave function that somehow represents these unobservable operators. You know, the, so then I get some reduced density matrix that is then thermal, but I, you know, but I don't quite know how to state this cleanly. Yeah, well, that would be that would be making an ensemble where the non-observable operators are unconstrained and the observable operators are constrained to be in right. whatever they are in your state, right? Right, right. That's a particular ensemble, right? And the ensemble is that they you could do that in a microcanonical way by really requiring the observables to have exactly the same value as in the state you're talking about, or you could do it with a Lagrange multiplier and do it more like a canonical ensemble, right? right. But the idea is all those non-observable operators, you know, in your state, they might have, you know, some of them might have some very special distributions which are not thermal equilibrium, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you don't know it. Um, Yes, but you know, we know that, it, that they do, right? You know, we know if you start from a non-equilibrium initial state and run it to thermal equilibrium and just run it for a little bit longer, it still has in it the memory that it was out of equilibrium very recently. Right. It's hidden in some non-equilibrium distributions of non-observable operators, right? right. Right. So, so, and, and, and presumably it's true, given that our universe is far from equilibrium and things are constantly changing, that actually the non-observable, a lot of the non-observable operators in our laboratories and in our lives are not at thermal equilibrium because very recently, you know, things have happened, right? Stuff is constantly happening, right? But, um, so, but, you know, there's so many of them, you know, the set that are, Doing something different than thermal equilibrium is probably a set of measure zero in the limit of a large system, and we can ignore it. Um, except in special cases, right? You know, there's spin echo where you know you you completely hide some special property, and then experimentally you can bring it back, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Thank but you. It, you know, it's not really hidden in a high order operator, right? It's really it's hidden in a in a way that you can bring back. Right? Um, Okay, but let Can me- Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah go ahead, please. Um, so you mentioned that this is a source of second law of thermodynamics. Um, yeah, but, at least informally speaking. The second law of thermodynamics is that things will move towards bigger spaces, right? So one-side operators will become two-side operators and two-side operators will become three-side operators. And so things will just go to places where there's more room. But the process is not actually irreversible, right? It's oh, it's not. It, it, this is reversible. This is reversible, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's mm -hmm. just almost all states will go that way towards mm -hmm. higher entropy. Right? But you know, there are you can in any system, any closed system you can prepare a state that looks like very high entropy, but will go to low entropy at some later time. All you do is you just go to that later time, prepare the low entropy state and mm -hmm. run the dynamics yeah. backwards, right? And then you get a state which looks like high entropy, but under the forward time dynamics, it's gonna violate the second law. The second law is not an absolute law, it's just a statistical law, right? Almost yeah. all states obey the second law but there is a very special set of states that don't. And they exist, we know they exist, they're very hard to prepare. Thank you. Is there a way of casting this in terms of like the complexity of the Hilbert space versus the complexity of what we define as the observable operators in that we- Well, people are beginning to explore this operator spreading. There is a very nice paper uh, from the Google group on their apparatus where they, you know, they really was looking at this in some detail. Um, 
watch, you know, preparing, you know, watching simple operators spread in their device, which has 53 qubits. Um, so, so this this kind of stuff, you know, now that it's discussed a lot theoretically, experimentalists are beginning to seriously explore it and demonstrate it. Yes. Yeah, I don't I don't think that paper's published. It's posted. Um, Okay. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about one thing that's related to this, which is about the eigenstates. So eigenstate formalization hypothesis. Often abbreviated ETH hypothesis. Right. So most of what I'm telling you for any realistic system, none of it's been proven. It's just tested rather thoroughly, numerically, and experimentally. Um, but most of these statements are too hard to prove. Um, and so this one has a name, hypothesis, and that's recognizing that, that uh, it's just a hypothesis. There are systems for which it's not true, but there are many systems for which it appears to be true. Um, this is uh, very briefly there in Landau and Lifshitz, um, but the, the papers, published papers, uh, looking at it, there's a nice early paper by Jensen and Shankar, uh, 1985, looking at a, a spin chain, a cha quantum chaotic spin chain of seven spins and, and finding uh, that it, the eigenstates are quite thermal. This was actually before the hypothesis was, was, was really formulated properly, but they had the idea. Um, and then the real strong formulation of this is due to Srednici. So there were a couple of papers in between. Um, but there's Srednici 1994 was when this was really you know, written out um, quite explicitly. And then of course, many, many papers afterwards in investigating it. And, elaborating it. Um, okay, so the thermalization dynamic that I was talking about before did not rely on the system having eigenstates, right? It, it didn't have to have a time independent Hamiltonian or a flow K operator. That time evolution operator could have been uh, you know, a non-periodic function of time, so there really weren't eigenstates. And, those systems can also thermalize. They just thermalize to, uh, right? if they have no conservation laws, they just thermalize to maximum entropy, which is really all states equally likely, right? Infinite temperature, you might call it, although it's not right to call it. If there's no conserved energy, there's no temperature, right? But people call that often infinite temperature. Um, um, Okay, but now I'm talking about eigenstates of the dynamics. And so let's say we have an H, which is independent of time, or a Floquet U, um, and, and therefore we have eigenstates of the dynamics. So we have these, and so we have eigenstates of the dynamics. And an eigenstate of the dynamics means it's time independent. So if we have a system that thermalizes from all initial states and it has eigenstates, all the eigenstates have to be thermal, right? Because the eigenstates go to themselves at infinite time. And if all initial states go to thermal equilibrium at infinite time, then the eigenstates have to be at thermal equilibrium right from the beginning because they're not changing, right? That's the essence of why the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis uh, is a natural thing. Um, okay. And this appears to be true. So, so, so ETH says, basically says, well, it says eigenstates are thermal. And then the strong version of ETH is all eigenstates are thermal. <laughs> 
So, so you know, people, some people entertain, and there are systems where almost all are thermal, but a few aren't. Um, but when we take generic quantum chaotic systems and actually look at all the eigenstates and look for the ones which are least thermal, and then take a limit of larger systems, you find even the least thermal eigenstate is becoming more thermal as you go to the large system. So it appears that there are broad classes of systems where the strong version of ETH is true, all of the eigenstates of the dynamics are thermal. Um, okay. Now, when this is true, then it says, uh, so, 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 so when you learned Cisco mechanics and you learned about the microcanonical ensemble, um, your teacher probably said, oh, you take all states in an energy interval between this and this and give them all equal weights, right? And then you couldn't really fix how wide that interval should be, right? And in fact, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, and there's no natural way of fixing it, right? You just, but ETH says for quantum systems, there is a natural way of fixing it shrink it down until it only contains one eigenstate. And so this tells you, you have what I call the one eigenstate microcanonical ensemble. And this is the natural microcanonical ensemble in a quantum system. But if you ask how wide an energy interval should I take, for my microcanonical ensemble, quantum, quantum physics gives you a scale, which is take one eigenstate, right? And if ETH is true, that's fine because those states are thermal. There's very little gap between like the next eigenstate, right? In the large system limit. Yeah, well, the gaps, the gaps are exponentially small in the number of degrees of freedom. Yeah. ETH has right, and exactly which eigenstate you pick doesn't matter. And that's why it doesn't matter how wide an energy interval you take because all the eigenstates in there give you exactly the same ensemble. And so if you add them all together, you get the same ensemble as well, right? And that's really why it doesn't matter how wide an energy interval you take when you make your microcanonical ensemble. And so, you know, the fact that it was left unspecified didn't really matter, right? But it's, it's sort of an annoying thing. Whereas in quantum mechanics, you know, it's clear what to do, just fix. And in classical mechanics, you can do, you can say all energy, all states with the same energy, right? And that's an energy shell, right? And that's a natural microcanonical ensemble in classical Cisco mechanics is fix the energy with a direct delta function. Right? In a quantum system, you do the same thing, but you got to have that delta function land on top of an eigenstate, right? If it lands between two eigenstates, you have nothing, right? Okay. David, just a clarification. When you say they are thermal, do you mean that they lead to a distribution equivalent for observables that are equivalent to a thermal the state? Uh, are at thermal equilibrium. Okay. In the limit of a large system, right? So there's always limits here, limit of large system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So, so now let me uh, say a, a little bit more about, uh, so ETH, so this ETH I'm saying here is what I call the diagonal part of ETH, meaning, you know, one eigenstate is thermal. And then there's uh, Srinichi pointed out, there's interesting stuff going on off the diagonal. And so let me just, just show you that. Um, so, so remember, so I'm, I'm gonna take my state and I'm gonna expand it uh, in the basis of, of, these, of the eigenstates. Let's, let's talk about a time independent Hamiltonian. So then this is something I wrote before, rho of T, the density matrix is sum over all eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, um, rho n m of zero, the initial state, um, n e to the i state of 
And so now let's take an observable um, and let's not time evolve the operator. So let's do this all in the Schrodinger picture. So, so we're gonna have some observable A and we're gonna look at its expectation value in this state at time T, right? And so what's that? That's a trace of uh, A times rho. Right? That's, how you, that's how you get the expectation value. Um, and if I write that out, that's got uh, a part due to the diagonal elements of rho, which, which looks like this, sum over n, rho n n, which doesn't depend on time. The diagonal elements in the, in the basis of the eigenstates, the diagonal elements of the density matrix are time independent, right? Because e n minus e n is zero. Um, Okay, and then n, a, n, right? So this is the diagonal part from the diagonal part of this. And then there's the off diagonal part, which is m not equal to n. And let me just write this out carefully. So that is, that's m, a, n, rho, n, m, zero, this, this factor here, e to the i. Okay, now the diagonal part of ETH. Okay, so if we have a state in the limit of a large system, its energy density is a constant. It has a well-defined temperature. And so all the eigenstates which have any weight in that state have the same energy density in the limit of a large system. They just differ sub-extensively in the energy. So they all correspond to exactly the same temperature and they have the same thermal uh, expectation value of the observable A. So these terms in this sum for where rho n n is non-zero, these are all constant. And so I can just factor this out. And this is the trace of a density operator and it's one, so I can just do that, right? And, and let me just rewrite this as the thermal, the expectation value of A under the conditions we're talking about, which is some temperature, some chemical potential, blah, 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 whatever conservation laws we have, right? And so this is what the system relaxes to at long times because it thermalizes, right? And so, so that's, this is the non-equilibrium part, right? And here's an off-diagonal matrix element of an observable in terms of the eigenstates of the dynamics. And this is the quantity we're interested in. And what we need here is we need the M A N large enough So this sum here, this term here, can be non-zero for n goes to infinity, right? So this sum here is how much is it out of equilibrium? We know we can prepare initial states with it out of equilibrium. So this sum, it must be possible to make this sum non-zero, pick initial states, uh, such that this sum is non-zero, right? And so therefore these matrix elements have to be big enough so that that's possible, right? But then we also need M, A, N small enough. So this here goes to zero for T goes to infinity. So being out of equilibrium is putting in a certain coherence in the off diagonal parts of the density matrix in terms of the eigenstates, such that this sum adds up cohere constructively and makes a non-zero contribution and you're out of equilibrium. And then with time, all that happens, this doesn't change, this doesn't change. All that happens is these phases change. And this sum 
changes from being constructive at time zero to just adding up a bunch of random numbers at later time. And these matrix elements have to be of a size so that that can happen. They can add up to something of order one, or when they're random, they add up to zero. Right? And so that's a requirement of the off, off diagonal part of the ETH. So Srednici talks about this. Um, and, and this, in my view, is not fully formulated, but I want to tell you what's known at this point about that. Um, probably shouldn't be spending so much time on this, but. I'm going to do it anyways. So if we have eigenstates obeying ETH, this is an observable. What are these matrix elements? Hey, David, quick question. Yeah, go ahead. How important is taking the order of N or T to infinity a matter? Uh, just a second. Let me get the lights back on. Well, right now, yeah. right, as was asked earlier, um, you know, when I say T goes to infinity, if I'm dealing with a finite size system, what I want is it to go to zero for large times at almost all times, right? So if we have a finite size system, there will be recurrences, and, but they're very rare, right? And so to say this very carefully, take those limits properly, you, you, you either take n goes to infinity first, and then time goes to infinity, um, or you take them together, or if you're gonna do finite n and take time goes to infinity, you have to say, almost all times, because there will be, re if, if n is finite and you go take time to infinity, you will find some recurrences, but they will be extremely rare and their probability will go to zero as you take n to infinity. So, so you know, taking those limits, one has to be a little careful with it um, because, of, because of the concern about recurrences, which was brought up earlier. Um, Thank you. I think the best thing is to take the two together, to infinity together, um, and to infinity and time goes to infinity together. And if you take n fast enough compared to t, you will remove the recurrences as you do that. Um, but anyways, so, so, so these off diagonal matrix elements, so this, this d is the dimension of the Hilbert space. So it's basically e to the s, where s is the entropy. Right. Um, so that's, these matrix elements are small. Right. Um, and the d to the half is such that they're not too small. And if you add them up constructively with the right phases, they can uh, not go to zero. Um, and then you have some function which depends on the operator and it's non-universal and it's a function of the energy difference. And it decays as you go to large energy difference. It might be non-monotonic. That's all very non-universal here, but it's, you know, it, it does decay at large energy differences. And then you have pseudo random uh, numbers, say with variance one, And what Srednici proposed is these are just random. But that's not true because our, you know, there are d squared of these, right? d is the Hilbert space dimension. There are d squared of these, whereas our Hamiltonian that we've diagonalized might have no random numbers in it, right? And so where do you get d squared random numbers out of no random numbers? So they're clearly pseudo-random. Right. 
And then the question is, what kind of correlations do they have? And there's a recent paper, I'll just yeah, finish with this, there's a recent paper by Shannon DeLuca uh, and Chalker. Uh, so what year is that, just a second, 2019. So there are uh, strong correlations due to locality. Right, if you have a Hamiltonian which, or a Floquet operator, which is local, there's causal, restri causal restrictions that you know, things can't spread any faster than a Lee Robinson speed or whatever. Um, and that imposes a lot of restrictions on these pseudo random numbers. Right? Um, but right now, so this is, this is what I call the off diagonal part of the ETH. Srednitsky formulated it this way and just called these random. Now we know they have, they do have a lot of correlations. So they're random for some purposes and for others not. And exactly what correlations have to be here and what correlations cannot be here and have the system thermalize and, and get all the physics right. I think that's still an open question, the details of that. Um, and so that's the, you know, the off diagonal part of of ETH. It's really a question about in, in the eigenstates, what do the off diagonal matrix elements of observables look like? You know, they look like random matrices with some structure, um, but exactly what structure they have or don't have is still not completely clear. Um, okay. Uh, I'm gonna skip one thing. I was gonna say some stuff about entanglement, but I will make the assumption, which may or may not be warranted, that you've heard a fair amount about entanglement, so I can talk about entanglement without really telling you too much about what it is. But if I say something about entanglement that doesn't make sense, please ask a question. Okay, so I just want to say one thing uh, addressing one of Leo's questions from the very beginning of the lecture on Monday um, about classical versus quantum. Okay, so classical. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I've seen some uh, constructions talking about uh, wave functions being kind of uh, random. And uh, yeah, I mean, in, in ETH, a, in a... ETH is basically a statement that the wave functions look like random wave functions drawn from a particular ensemble with certain statistics, but they're basically random, the eigenfunctions. Mm -hmm. How do you see the connection with the, uh, with the formula that you just wrote down? I mean, is it obvious the connection? Well, if, 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 if uh, yeah, so the square root of, D is the central limit theorem, right? If you have a d-dimensional Hilbert space and you have a random wave function you've drawn in it, um, and, and then you put in an operator, which is just a local operator, you know, say you put it in the basis of the eigenstates of that operator, right? Then you're gonna have, uh, you know, you, you take that matrix element, you're just adding up a bunch of random numbers and you get something, uh, um, right? You, you have a wave function, so, so we have psi, I write it in the, in the basis of the eigenstates of my operator, and it has, uh, it has uh, wave, it has uh, its amplitudes on each eigenstate are d to the minus a half, right? So that adds, so that it's normalized, right? And then I take, uh, so this is now say an eigenstate, yeah, so I'm going to take n, I'm going to write it in, in the eigenstates of a, right? And so now when a acts on n in this basis, it just multiplies, it gives factors of order one. And so now we're going to have d terms, when I do this sum, d terms each of order one over d, right? Because I've taken an amplitude here, which is d to the minus a half, and one here, which is d to the minus one half. So d terms each of order 
one over D, right? And if I do that by central limit theorem, I will get something which is of order D to the minus a half, right? If each one is one over D and I add up D of them and they're random, I will get D to the minus a half, right? And so that's, that's the D to the minus a half I showed in Srinichi's ansatz, right? So that sort of is the beginnings of, I think, answering what you're asking. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. Thanks. Um, and there's, but then there's more structure. There's more structure than that, right? Because you know you've got an upper, you've got an eigenstate at a particular energy. You hit it with an observable. You can't change the energy by very much with just with an observable operator because it's just hitting a few sites. So it just it has no overlap with states far away in energy. It's only overlapping with states nearby in energy, and that's why the function of the energy difference. Nice. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody else was asking. Um, yeah, so in that equation that you had for um, A and M, you had a D to the minus one half there, but I thought now the D to the minus one half is coming from the sum. So why wasn't it one over D there in the formula with like F A, E N minus E M, R N M, unless I wrote it down wrong, I don't know. Um, it, we, we got erased, but let's leave this aside for later discussion. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. So sorry, I just I just uh, feeling I'm getting behind, and I. Okay, so I wanted to say something. So say we have classical system obeying Newton's equations. Okay. Now the first statement is they don't exist. Right. This is just a fiction. Everything's quantum, right? And classical systems are highly entangled, but let's do Newtonian fiction of classical systems which interact and don't get entangled, right? Doesn't exist, but let's talk about it because it's, you know, the liter the, your textbooks are full of it, right? Full of it in two senses. They're full of Newtonian dynamics and Newtonian dynamics is full of it because there are no classical systems. Everything's quantum, everything is highly entangled. Um, but, uh, okay, so, right. They thermalize only in a weaker sense than quantum. I think this is an interesting point, at least to me. Um, so let's start our system in a pure state. That's, remember, that's also a fiction, right? So this is all about theoretical fictions, angels dancing on ahead of a pin, but that's okay. We're used to that. So let's start in a pure state. And a, class, a quantum pure state is is this density operator. That's the quantum case. And the classical case is one configuration. Okay. If it's a, say it's a, say it's a, a liquid, every, every atom we give its position and its momentum. Right. One configuration. Okay. And this evolves at time t to pure states, right. both Quantum unitary dynamics and classical Newtonian equations are reversible and pure states go to pure states. Okay. okay, so the state remains pure at all times in both cases, right? If I start it pure. Um, the quantum system quantum system uh, generally gets entangled. So subsystems are in mixed states. Any subsystem, so if I have an observable on one particular region of the system, that subsystem is in a mixed state. And it's, it, and it's entangled with the rest of the system and the full system is in a pure state. That's what happens under thermalizing dynamics of quantum systems. And this allows at one particular time, 
So at time t, specific time t from some initial state, it allows the quantum system to have thermal distributions, right? Even though we're in one specific state, the subsystems have distributions. They're in mixed states and the mixed states can be thermal, right? Whereas the classical system, subsystems remain in pure states. Right? If you have a classical configuration, it tells you where every atom is and what's its momentum. And so any subsystem, I look at it, you know exactly where every atom is and what's its momentum. It's not in a thermal distribution, it's in a specific state, right? So classical quantum systems at a given time are thermal when they thermalize. Whereas classical systems at a given time, they're in a specific state. In order to get a thermal distribution for classical systems, you either have to average over time to get a distribution, or you have to give it an initial state which had a distribution. And if you gave it an initial state that has a distribution and it's chaotic, that distribution will spread all over the place and make thermal distributions. So this is just pointing out how thermalization, as I've defined it, it's special to quantum systems and classical systems actually don't thermalize uh, by this definition. You need to do a little bit more to have classical systems thermalize. It's an interesting point, um, not necessarily that important, but I think it's a good one to mention. Questions about that or anything else? Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna try to I'm gonna transition to systems that do not thermalize, right? And so questions about thermalization generally, what I've said. So, so David, perhaps one question. I mean, the classical system can be nonlinear, and with the nonlinear dynamics, they can apparently thermalize too, yes. Yeah, well, they thermalize, but in a, you can, they thermalize in a different sense. I'm just saying the definite, you can choose a definition of thermalization where quantum systems do thermalize and classical systems don't. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can change your definition to accommodate the classical systems. And that's what's normally done classically, of course. Right, and, and the two common things are to give your initial state a probability distribution, which is continuous, mm -hmm. that's enough. Right, right. The, the classical systems that do thermalize are nonlinear and chaotic. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so they, that's a requirement, mm -hmm. right? But then to have them thermalize in that they really go to a thermal distribution, you need to, to get that distribution, you either need to have a distribution in your initial state, okay. or you need to do some time averaging to get the distribution. Okay. If, you, if you have a specific pure initial state and go to a specific long time, the classical system is in a specific final state. It's not in a distribution. Whereas the quantum system, is in a thermal state, a pure state, which is thermal and has the thermal properties with the probability distributions of thermal equilibrium for the observables, mm -hmm. right? So that's a, it's a contrast. Um, you, know, you could say, I'm just being unfair to the classical systems by choosing a definition that they can't live with, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's pointing out the role of entanglement, right? The entanglement is the key part of that. Okay. The quantum systems have an option for how to thermalize using entanglement that the classical systems don't have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not all systems thermalize. And I'll mention very quickly two of them that I'm not going to lecture about. So one of them is what's called quantum many-body stars. 
webinars. Um, a very recent uh, topic of activity, which started because of some experiments, um, but it's become a big subject. And these are systems where a few of the eigenstates are not thermal. So they don't obey ETH in the strong sense. They have some eigenstates which are observably very non-thermal and are reasonably easy to prepare. So it's easy in the lab to get yourself into them. Um, and that's why they were discovered experimentally before the theorists figured it out. Um, but most of the eigenstates are thermal. So, so this is a different mechanism than what I mentioned before. It's not due to conservation laws, conserved operators. It's due to there being particular uh, eigenstates of the dynamics, which are not thermal, are accessible, and can be prepared. Right? And those are called the SCAR states. And I, that's not something I'm going to talk about, but I should mention it because it is one case of systems that don't thermalize. The other one is what I would call traditional integrable systems. And these have many uh, delocalized Reserved operators. Observable conserved operators. Okay. And that's why they don't thermalize, because you can take some of these observable conserved operators, put them in a non-equilibrium distribution, and they'll just stay in that distribution and remain observable. So the so the so the being out of equilibrium will be will be uh, remain observable. But in this case, the operators that are strictly conserved are, they're not, they're operators that are summed over the whole system, like the total energy, the total particle number, and then various total currents. And so, so delocalized, this is in a different sense than what I was talking about when I was talking about non-observable. So it's an observable operator, meaning it involves just a few sites, but then you have to add it up over the whole system to make the conserved quantity, like the total energy. Right? You have the Hamiltonian, it's got a sum of a bunch of terms. What's conserved is the sum. If you just take one term in the Hamiltonian, it's typically not conserved. Right? And similarly with the things that happen in traditional inter integrable systems, you know, beta on that solvable, et cetera. Um, okay. So this is another type of system that does not thermalize, which I'm not gonna talk about. And as far as we know, both of these cases, if you add a, generic perturbation to the system, short range you know, change to the Hamiltonian or the Floquet unitary, these don't have stability. They're fine tuned and you make a perturbation, to a finite, small but finite local perturbation to the Hamiltonian or the Floquet unitary that's not fine tuned, these will thermalize. Okay. As far as we know, you know again, no proofs, but as far as we as far as we know, um, and then the third case is is the one I'm going to talk about for the remainder of this lecture, and next is many-body localization. Which is MBL, and here it's also a type of integrability, and what you have in many-body localization is a complete set of localized conserved operators. And so now you can locally put it out of equilibrium in a particular way by having a local conserved operator out of equilibrium and that distribution that out of equilibrium distribution and that distribution will not change and it will stay local. So, so you can have the system locally out of equilibrium in a way that remains uh, localized near the place where you uh, did it. Okay. And so that's what I wanna go to now, many body localization. Um, and 
And to build into that, I'm going to start with some sort of simpler cases. Questions about anything that's up here? Okay. So what I want to do next is a single particle, actually, maybe not say single particle, let me say non-interacting. Interacting Anderson localization as many body localization. Okay. So let's consider a one D chain of sites. Here's the sites. Coordinate X. And then there's on site terms, EX, EX plus one. Those are on site terms. And then we're going to have a hopping term, PX hopping from one site to the other. So let's have a one dimensional chain, tight binding model. Uh, let's say spinless for now, let's say spinless fermions on it. Um, we have on-site energies, which differ from site to site. And then we have hopping terms, which may differ from bond to bond, just nearest neighbor hopping, just to keep it simple. Okay. And, and we want to be in the regime of strong Anderson localization. So typically, if I look at a so here's the energy, oops. If I look at a pair of nearest neighbor sites, the two energies differ by some amount. And then there's a hopping between these sites. And we want typically for most pairs of nearest neighbor sites, Tx is much less than the energy difference. So that we can treat the hopping perturbative. That's the regime I want to be in where Anderson localization is quite simple. Um, so here's my Hamiltonian, H equals uh, sum over X, DX. Creation and annihilation operators, and then plus T X X plus one. So conjugate. One dimension with nearest neighbor hopping. I can always choose a gauge such that the hoppings are real. You can actually choose a gauge such the hoppings are negative or positive, whatever you want. Um, because there's no loops. Um, yeah. Absolute value there, just to, just to be more precise about what I mean. Okay, so this is, this is uh, now what I require is these energies are such that uh, there's no degeneracies. So E sub N is not equal to E sub M. We have no degeneracies in the chain. So there's no translational invariance and the typical differences are larger than the hopping. Um, uh, you may have been told that an essential feature of Anderson localization is randomness, but that's not true. Uh, the essential feature is no translational invariance. Um, you, these energies do not have to be random. They could be some other sequence, which is non-random, like quasi-periodic. Um, and you have Anderson localization. So Anderson localization does not require randomness. And in fact, we published a paper a few years ago showing that 
in three dimensions uh, in the renormalization group sense for the phase transition out of Anderson localization, the randomness is irrelevant. If you take a quasi-periodic Anderson model of the right type, it has a certain universality class of that delocalization transition. You add randomness, it's irrelevant, nothing changes. But, but one question, David. So in 1D, you have quasi-periodic, it's not going to localize in infinite disorder, yes? You have to have a threshold value of the disorder. No, it's the other, it's, it's, it's in the one other way around. You need, uh, right. So if, if I'm in this regime, it's localized. If you go to the other limit where you have the hopping and the hopping's not random, and then you put weak quasi-periodic potentials, it doesn't, Localize. Exactly. So you need a threshold of epsilon in order to localize. I mean, you need to have epsilon larger than certain amount in, in order regime. to localize. I'm going to be in that regime, right? So, so it's this. Okay. Condition. It's this condition here. Okay. Okay. I see. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So this has, if 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 these are unequal and we're in this limit here. Um, Basically, what happens is you can treat this perturbatively. If this is at, if the hopping is absent, the eigenstates are clearly just states on each site. So one eigenstate is here, one eigenstate here, each site. And then you add this hopping. And if the hopping matrix element is small compared to the energy differences that it connects, that's just a small perturbation. And the eigenstates will stay localized primarily on that one site. Occasionally, when I say typically here, I mean, oh, there might be some cases where this is not true, and then the eigenstate will get delocalized over two or four sites or something like that, but some finite number, right? Mm -hmm. And so we get all single particle eigenstates are localized. And what that means is their wave function, it's concentrated on of order one site, but it does have tails. So the wave function has non-zero weight all the way out to infinity, but the amplitude of the wave function is decaying exponentially as you go away from the, the site where the wave function is localized. Um, so that's single particle localization. Um, and then, in terms of the eigenstates, so the single particle eigenstates, I'm going to call alpha. So let's say alpha are the eigenstates. Um, and then C alpha dagger creates a particle in localized single particle eigenstate alpha. And that has energy E alpha, which is very close to the energy of the site it's localized on, but it's perturbed a little bit away from it due to the hopping, okay? And then this Hamiltonian becomes, actually, let me call this H naught because I'm gonna add interactions. So, so this is before I add the interactions, H naught. This same Hamiltonian becomes sum over all single particle eigenstates alpha, E alpha, C alpha dagger, C alpha. And I've diagonalized it. So this is sort of a trivial statement. I diagonalize it. I write it in terms of its eigenstates. Um, now we can say all the single particle eigenstates are local, have localized wave functions, but we could also say we have the operators in alpha, which is C alpha dagger C alpha, that's the number operator for the occupation of single particle eigenstate alpha. And we have a, all these operators are here in the Hamiltonian. They commute with each other. So we have this structure. So the Hamiltonian is a sum of these operators. They all commute with each other. So therefore they commute with the Hamiltonian. So we have a Hamilton, we have a, let me just write it out here again. We have a complete set 
of localized inter operators. And they are just the occupation operators. So whenever you have an, an Anderson localization problem, you can say all the single particle eigenstates have localized wave functions, or you could say, viewing it more as a many body problem, I have an integrable system with a complete set of localized conserved operators, and those operators are the number operators for the single particle eigenstates. So it's a way of describing localization in terms of operators instead of in terms of wave functions. And this one translates fine to many body localization. That's why I'm saying it this way, because this is exactly the structure that many, the many body localized phase has. It doesn't have localized wave functions, but it does have localized conserved operators. Um, now, of course, this I could do, I did it in 1D, but you know, I could do this in any dimension. You can have Anderson localization with all single particle eigenstates localized in any dimension. Um, so, so this construction you could do in, in any dimension if you, you know, if you make the hopping weak enough and the energy difference is large enough. Any questions about that? This whole discussion, I don't know, like very trivial when you're saying the hopping is very small and therefore there's no dispersion. Isn't that kind of an obvious statement? Yeah, the, yeah what I have here is all very simple and essentially trivial, yes. I'm just wondering why, like, I don't mean to say anything against Mr. Anderson, but what's, what am I missing here? Is there supposed to be something that is that I shouldn't have guessed? Or... No, like, no. Why is this no. big thing? You know, people always say Anderson localization. But it can be happen for infinitesimal disorder. I think that's the non-trivial part. No, yes. There's, there's a lot more to the story than this. Mm -hmm. No, in fact, yeah. Anderson. You know, Anderson's paper was 1958, and. You know, what he said, you know, in some sense was kind of simple because he was talking about this limit mostly. Um, and, and the paper essentially got ignored for uh, over a decade um, until people started appreciating, you know, more subtle issues about it. Like in one dimension, I don't, if I have randomness on the energy, on the energies here, I don't have to do this. Right? And all single particle states will be localized if these are random, even if the hopping is much stronger than the, and that's so-called weak right, localization. That's non-trivial, right, that's non-trivial. Right? And that's non-trivial, right? right. Okay. Anderson didn't have that, that was later, right? So in the 70s, people started realizing, oh, this is really an interesting problem. There's a lot to do here. Thales, uh, other people, Thales was one of the most important people doing that stuff. Um, but you're right, you know, the, 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 the basic Anderson localization in the strong localization limit is in some sense simple. Um, and you're, and nobody got excited about it, you know, when Anderson first showed it, <laughs> it was only, you know, he had many body localization in that paper as well, uh, as, as I'll tell you. Um, because he was he was doing interacting spins. He wasn't doing particles hopping. He wasn't doing a single particle problem. He was doing the many body problem. He just approximated it with a single particle problem. Um, so David is three thirty. So how we are, how you are on time? So, so let me just say something here. Okay. So now I've got this Hamiltonian. I deliberately wrote it second quantized so that I can just say, oh, it's a many body problem, right? And 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 these could have been bosons. That would have been fine too. The number operator is fine for bosons, right? Um, so they could have been bosons. Um, but let's now take this system and not look at it as a single particle problem. Let's look at it as a many body problem, right? And we're going to find it's, uh, we're going to put in a non zero density of particles. And so of all these eigenstates localized everywhere, some of them are occupied, some of them are going to be empty. And I'm going to have a many body wave function, right? 
And the many body eigenstates will be eigenstates of all these number operators, right? Each, each single particle state will be occupied with some number of particles, zero, one, or more than one if we're talking about bosons, right? And so now it's a many body problem. We still got it diagonalized. It's still got this structure. The wave functions are not localized in real space, right? If I wrote down the real space wave function, right? Of course, it's got many particles, many arguments, and there's particles everywhere, right? Because I put particles everywhere, you know, some places higher density, some places lower density, but the wave functions, you know, they don't decay. And so everywhere there's some density of particles, right? And so the wave functions are no longer localized in real space. They're localized in this space of good quantum numbers, of course, they're eigenstates in that space. Um, and, but the, the many body problem still has this structure here in that it's got localized conserved operators, right? And that structure will remain when we add the interactions and really do the, think of the many body problem with interactions, which is many body localization. Um, so the localization in many body localization, to the extent there's localization in real space, it's not of eigenfunctions or wave functions, it's of eigen operators, operators that commute with each other and with the Hamiltonian and therefore are conserved. And so I'll, I'll, that's what the remaining lecture tomorrow will be about. Um, Excellent. Any, Excellent. any, yeah, please, more questions? At some point, you mentioned that, I guess for integrable systems, you said, if you add some, some perturbation or something that it generally thermalizes. Yes. So, and, so, so in one dimension for, you can turn on weak interactions, non-zero interactions, and the system will stay many body localized. And that phase, unlike traditional integrable systems or quantum scars to our knowledge, is believed to be stable to turn it to small changes to the Hamiltonian that are short range. So M many body localization appears to be the one case of systems that don't thermalize that has a certain robustness to generic perturbations to the Hamiltonian, but they have to be, it's only in one dimension and it has to be only short range perturbations to the Hamiltonian. You add long range interactions, it'll destabilize it. I was thinking in terms of like- an More analog. stability than the other cases. In terms of the KAM theorem, I think in classical there, they have this thing, right? That given a small enough perturbation, you are always stable, I think something like that. Well, KAM, okay, so KAM is classical and that, that, that there are parallels with KAM, but you know, KAM is, it, it's different, right? So a KAM, first of all, it's not in the limit of many degrees of freedom. It's for a system, a nonlinear system with just a few degrees of freedom. And it's not all states, right? So when you, when you add the perturbation to a generic you know, KAM stable system, it's just some of the trajectories remain on KM tori, but other ones become chaotic. So it becomes a mixed configuration space where islands of chaos and islands of laminar behavior, right? Whereas in this case here, you know, we're talking about all the eigenstates being localized, right? And, and, and we're talking about it remaining true in the limit of many degrees of freedom. The KM question, is there any, you know, what do you need to have a KM stable system in the limit of an infinite number of degrees of freedom? This is still an open question. And similarly, is, you know, what do you need to have classical many body localization with nonlinearities and interactions? That's an open question. You know, you can probably do it in some fine tuned way, but nobody's really demonstrated that yet. Um, but my get, I, I'm almost certain that would be fine tuned and would not be stable. Um, but that, but yeah, the questions of classical many-body localization, as well as you know, how does KM 
behave as you take the limit of an infinite system? These are very interesting, but open questions. Um, but but it, it certainly appears there's much less stability of, of classical. It's basically because, you know, what is thermalization? The thermalization is the system being a bath for itself. And what do you need to have a bath? A bath is, it's, it's something that has a continuous spectrum that it can take energy in any unit you give it, right? It doesn't have a discrete spectrum, right? And classically chaotic systems with just two or three degrees of freedom can do that, right? Whereas a quantum system, as long as it's finite, its spectrum is discrete and it can't really be a full bath, right? And so you really can only get a real bath with a continuous spectrum in a quantum system in the limit of an infinite system. Whereas a classical system, you know, just a, a little nonlinear system with, you know, three or four degrees of freedom can be chaotic and have a, have a spectrum which is a continuous support over all frequencies and you couple it to anything and it can exchange energy with it. So, so classical systems are, you know, it's much harder to localize them because of that. David. Quantum, quantum chaos is not chaos when the number of degrees of freedom is not infinity, <laughs> right? It's only in the limit of uh, you know, infinite quantum numbers or infinite number of degrees of freedom that you really get quantum chaos. Otherwise, quantum systems, it's just a discrete spectrum, right? So in the, in the interacting case, can you elaborate on what alpha and beta labels are? Uh, are they still? Yeah, that's that's uh, so, so, so we're gonna add the, I'm just gonna give a preview of next time. So we're gonna add to this interactions. Um, and then what you do, uh, kind of in the spirit of what you do in Fermi liquid theory is we have these conserved quantities. You know, think of Fermi liquid theory, you have non-interacting fermions, you got a Fermi surface, you got particles, everything's conserved. And then you add the interactions and what do you do? You dress the particles to make quasi particles to make them as long lived as possible, right? And so we do the same thing here. We, we dress these conserved quantities to try to maintain these, these commutation relations. And in this case, many body localized one dimension weak enough interactions, you can actually do it. And so, you just deform, you know, the Hamiltonian will change. It's got now got interactions in it. We're gonna to add to these operators, multi-site terms chosen carefully. And I'm not gonna demonstrate how to do that. We don't really have a systematic way of doing it. Um, multi-site and multi-body multi operations. Equations yeah. remain true. But, right. but David, you are going to cover this in detail next lecture. Yes, that's, that's the whole grail of next question, not that's next lecture. Good an opportunity to give a preview. Yeah, I think it's good. But just in this, con but I, I mean, they get dressed in the same way that you talked about unobservable operators. They'll get dressed. No, no, no. Uh, not in no, real they're space. They're observable. They're observable. This no, is no, 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 the, the tails. Dress it with short range, few slight terms. So all the dressing will be observables and it decays exponentially with distance. So it's, so it, they remain observable after being dressed. But what I'm trying to say, it's not just in the side basis, it's also in the operated sense that get longer. You now get, uh, you get admixtures of other operators that are beyond just a quadratic in series. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Right. But, but, but the series converges, so, yes. so, so it's still localized, right? And when we right. say the single particle eigenstates are localized, right, we mean not they're on one site, it's right. their inside an envelope, which decays exponentially. Sure, sure. And now we're yeah. going to do a similar thing in operator space, where they're inside an envelope in terms of the complexity of the operator that decays exponentially. So they're going to be dressed with, you know, two site terms, four site terms, eight site terms, blah blah, you know, seven site. Terms. It decays exponentially. But that's why I was confused. Those terms as they get higher and higher order are going to decay exponentially. So they're still localized in that sense. But that's why I was a little bit confused when you said uh, 
not in you know once it's a many body system it's not local i mean if i look at the single the wave functions are not all i said is the wave functions are not localized no no but if in the wave function it depends on many coordinates of n particles so if i grab one of those particles, indistinguishable particles you know yeah. everywhere in space there is a substantial well, probability of finding a particle yeah okay after you symmetry and to symmetrize i guess but yeah you, yeah, say they're say they're spinless fermions, they're indistinguishable, right? And so it's really just one wave function, right? Well, wave function of many coordinates. I start moving one of that coordinate away yeah, yeah. from the well, side. You can go to Fox space. You can go to Fox space, which is the eigenstates of this, right? And they're localized in that space. Yeah. Okay. So the wave functions are localized, but not in real space. They're localized in the many-body Fox space, and I'll talk about that a bit. Okay. But you know, if you just focus on Fox space and not on real space, you know, you won't even notice you've got these localized conserved operators. You know, this was something you know Bosco, Elena, Altschuler did that. You know, and they knew all about the localization in Fox space, but they didn't know about this structure at all because they weren't looking in real space. You know, they were only looking in Fox space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was much later. This was uh, Serbin, Papic, Abenin, and me and Nankishore and Oganesian. Re realize this really is the structure, right? And you know, I always prefer to be in real space, right? Well, that's where you make measurements. Well, yeah, and it's 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 more it's easier to think about. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe on that note. We can uh, wrap up for the day and thank David again. I'm happy to. I'm happy to ask answer more questions if somebody wants to ask. But uh, yeah, yeah. I think the students have been in lectures since very early in the morning. So sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I understand. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank bye you. Bye bye. David. Thank you, David. Thank you.